It's Sunday, May 16th, and this is For Good Reason. Welcome to For Good Reason. I'm DJ Grothy. For Good Reason is the radio show and the podcast produced in association with the James Randi Educational Foundation, an international nonprofit whose mission is to advance critical thinking about the paranormal, pseudoscience, and the supernatural. This week, we continue the broadcast of the interview I conducted with Ray Hyman, Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Oregon, about as many decades as a widely respected expert critic of parapsychology. This interview was conducted last month for the occasion of Professor Hyman receiving the 2010 Philip J. Class Award for Outstanding Contributions in Promoting Critical Thinking and Scientific Understanding, conferred to him by the National Capital Area Skeptics, a D.C. area local skeptics organization, and it was conducted at the National Science Foundation. So our interview picks up right where it left off last week. Maybe we'll uh, finish up by exploring wh- how we got to be skeptics, right? I find that an interesting question. But uh, you mentioned Uri Geller, and you've spoken in the media about Uri Geller, and you've done research into dowsing and other parapsychology claims, like individual claimants, as opposed to being an expert critic of parapsychology research. Those are kind of two halves of your career, and I draw a distinction between those two kinds of efforts. Is one more compelling or interesting to you than the other? Is one kind of skepticism more important to you than the other? That's a leading question, but yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I always find parapsychology dull. I find it very dull and not interested in it at all. Mm-hmm. And I find that the fun part of skepticism is dealing with Uri Gela and uh, the mediums who talk to the dead and the dowsers who... Uh, find uh, not only find water but they can find the gold and 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 Shendley's number nine depending on what they put in their uh, dowsing rod or their pendulum i find all that that part fast that to me is fun part (laughs) the 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 parapsychology part is not fun i got stuck into it uh, unfortunately and they they always come to me Uh, the time i put into it to me, it's just wasted for mm. me. I, do, I, I prefer to do other things. Do you regret it? Do you regret the 50 years of uh, expert not, criticism? Not really regret, but I, I regret it if I think about it in the sense <laughs> that, um, that all the things I could have done professionally mm. and otherwise, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. this took up a lot of my time. Mm-hmm. It's boring, as you said, and I just don't find it fun. And, and it sounds like you're more interested in the psychology of belief questions than the parapsychology questions. Yes, definitely. So rather than the evidence of psi, you're interested more in why people believe this stuff, right. despite the lack of evidence. That's so, right. Yeah. And so if you had it all to do over again, would that be more of a focus for you? You never know, but yes. <laughs> you never know, but yes. I like that answer. Uh I, I want to have some time for audience questions, but I want to ask you about the last 35 years of the movement, right? And from your vantage, you see that there's grown up around the world, not just the United States, but really around the world, a worldwide skeptics movement. When you and Martin Gardner and uh, Randy and Paul Kurtz and others founded PSYCOP, you didn't sit in some back room with some plan to create a worldwide movement, right? You were just thinkers coming together, wanted to offer criticism of these prevailing beliefs, correct? Well, there are many creation stories about the founding of the movement, <laughs> and we're going to go into some of them at the at next the next amazing right. meeting, yes. I'll just announce for our, our listeners that for the f- first time in the history of TAM, we're going to have a panel on the history, the origins of the skeptics movement featuring Ray and Paul Kurtz and Randy and uh, Ken Fraser and hopefully Martin Gardner by video. So those are interesting questions. But I'm asking you about the really the movement aspect of it. Was there a plan for there to be a movement around these ideas and ideals? What happened was it wasn't that well organized, obviously. But what happened as far as I'm concerned was um, the key things that led to the current skeptics movement was Martin Gardner, his fads and fallacies in the name of science. Mm-hmm. That's the 
that's that's the thing we all look towards. One of the sacred texts. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Good way of putting it. And then uh, there was Alice Cooper, and and Uri Geller had a big hand in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason with Alice Cooper, uh, uh, by the way, Geller has a hand in it because 1972, I get a call from the uh, Colonel Austin Kibler, who was then head of um, uh, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, the same group that brought you the internet. Um, and uh, they, that's the group that was founded by President Kennedy to be the Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon part of the Defense Department, to look into futuristic things. And I got a call from him, and I was grading papers at the University of Oregon. I got a call from him in 1982, December, saying, Ray, could you drop whatever you're doing and go down to Stanford Research Institute? where they have a psychic in captivity who they're studying. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Uri Geller. That was Uri, happened yeah. to be Uri Geller. Yeah. And um, uh, so I went down here, of course, and, uh, and it was the most bizarre thing I ever saw. And then uh, as a result of my report, uh, they knew they weren't, weren't going to get any money from the Defense Department, so they took Geller on the road, and they went to New York and... Uh, promenaded them in front of New York Times and uh, Time Magazine, and mm-hmm. Time Magazine got Randy to pretend that he was a reporter and sit in uh, when Geller did his demo for them, and that's when Randy saw uh, when the chicanery. Ran- yeah. Well, well, when Geller left the room, Randy apparently replicated a lot of what Geller did and showed it was a, a, f- a fraud. But anyways, as a result of that, in 1972, uh, Time Magazine had an article called "The Magician and the Think Tank." Mm-hmm. And they they pointed out how Randy had uh, that uh, here is this psychic. So the first written public publicity re- Geller got in this country was a expose by Time magazine. And, and this they, was they, before Psycho. This is seventy two. Oh yeah, not this is before this seventy two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. you were all connected even then. No, or you're getting no, connected? no. What happened is Geller was the one who get, should get the credit for connecting us. So. <laughs> what happened was. Uh, as a result of this, I didn't know Randy that well at that mm-hmm. time. I knew of him, and he knew of me, mm-hmm. because we were both, and both were, were disciples of Martin Gardner. Yeah. But I was out here in Oregon, uh, out in Oregon, and um, uh, so as a result of this article, you know, I'm in it and Randy's in it. We are the two key people who uh, were exposing Gower at that time. Randy then was traveling on the, with Alice Cooper. I knew nothing, but I don't know. My, my, the the not, rock star Alice Cooper, yeah, Randy, was yeah. part of his Yeah, I his thought Alice show. Cooper was a she when he called me about it. <laughs> uh, but anyways, he was traveling with Alice Cooper. And Alice Cooper, I don't know if you know about it. It's a, I didn't know much about it. I don't know much about modern music. I stopped with Beethoven and I, anything after that. It's <laughs> is, is, is too much for me. But anyway, uh, I get a call from Randy. He's traveling. He's, he's part of the show. Randy was traveling as a mad dentist, then later becomes a mad magician. And he cuts off Alice's head in a guillotine, and he dances around the stage, just how they end the, end the show, apparently, with uh, the blood dripping from Alice's head. <laughs> and then they, they, everything goes black, and then they, there's a long pause, and then there's a resurrection scene, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, Alice comes back from life, and that's, that's, that's how they end the show. Mm-hmm. And Randy was a big feature of it, of course. So Randy was traveling with the show, and they came to Portland, and I get this call from Randy when he's in Portland. He says, Ray... Uh, you got to come up here. Alice Cooper wants to see you. He, he wants you to look at the show and, and explain to him why he's got two, only why he's got uh, these problems with his fans. He's got very young teenagers like him and college students like him, but high school students have nothing to do with him. <laughs> and so he figured if I, uh, so Randy told him about me as a psychologist and stuff like that, and he said he thought that somehow I could come up and watch the show and explain to him all that. <laughs> And so this sounded all already weird. I didn't know what Alice Cooper was even, or who or she, uh, he was. And then he said also, but he didn't mention that that, in that column, uh, the, the other reason he wanted to talk to me. So I went up there, I met Alice Cooper, and it, and it turned out to be a he. Uh, at least I think it was a he. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> actually, a pretty nice guy, and he's a very conservative guy. I was surprised, you know, uh, politically. Yeah. And he had his nose bent. And it turned out he'd fallen, and he used to run marathons, and he'd fallen at the end of a marathon and fell on his nose. And so he knew, so when he found out I had ran marathons, we became good friends because, you know, we were saying talk on marathoning and everything else. Uh, but um, in all of this, you know, I went, I was on the stage, uh, they put earphones in me, so fresh, fortunately I was on the side, and between every act, Alice would come to me when they had a blackout, 
come over. He acted like he was drunk. He's falling. I'm about to fall over. And he actually was uh, addicted to beer, not, not to drugs. Everyone else in his troop were, were into bug. They were smoking all kinds of stuff. But he only drank beer, a Coors beer. And, um, <laughs> and he would come to me. Uh, he would straighten up in between the acts when, the, when the, all the lights went out. He'd run over to me and explain to me what's going on. He said, now, wait, wait, wait this next act, you're going to see the, the kids are going to throw things at me. You know, they're going to be mad at me because I'm, I'm going to insult their parents. And he would explain everything. And he had perfect control of everything. But he knew more about what's going on than I did. Mm. He didn't need my advice on that. But the other thing is, in between all this, Randy took me aside and said, you know, Ray, we ought to do something about this Siri Geller business and, uh, and, and, and general the public's interest in all this crazy stuff. And so he said, let's form an organization called Sir. That was his name for it. Uh, you know, SRI, he took the initials SRI and made SIR, Sir, and he meant by that sanity in research. So that was the first suggestion or anything. So he, we called Martin Gardner, so he, Martin Gardner, and I found our group that's called Sir, we called it, and we changed it to some other names. And we started that in 1972. We had a big meeting at Martin's house, big, the three of us. That was it. <laughs> uh, then, uh, sometime later, I don't know how we heard about it, but Marcello Trutzi, who I knew nothing about, we didn't know anything about it, uh, contacted us and said, look, he heard about our group and he'd like to join if he could and he could help us out, you know, because he has a, he's a good administrator, he mm -hmm. willing to do all the scut work for us. And the one thing that Martin, Randy, and I did not have, any, we did have no administrative abilities. We didn't know how to run anything. We just had the, we were good idea people. <laughs> we spent all the time just thinking of ideas, what to do, but we weren't and, able to. And Trucci, as an academic, wanted to help yeah, provide offered. some structure to Exactly. The, and to we the group. said, that's what we need. So we said, okay. And uh, so Trucci became part of our group. And then the next thing happened is Trucci met uh, Paul Kurtz in 1976 right. at some conference. I don't know what it was. And they both, at that time, Kurtz was running the Humanist magazine and he was, had also been running articles, including my, by myself, on critical of paranormal stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so PSYCOP was originally kind of a subcommittee of the American Humanist Association or something? It, or Well, no, we, uh, we, we, we tried to make it clear that we weren't going to be connected, and that's been the point of friction ever since. Yeah, the split. Yeah. Uh, but um, what happened was that he, without asking Martin, Randy, or myself, Marcelli vol uh, Marcello volunteered to, pull, to, to put us together with... Kurtz and his group, and we'd form this big group called PSYCOP. And so we had a big meeting in 76, and mm -hmm. that's how Ralph started. Mm -hmm. So the reason I asked the movement question is that in recent years, you've been speaking out more, suggesting to audiences that some of the approaches of oh, the expert critics of parapsychology, some of your approaches may have been misguided. Again, don't want to put words in your mouth, but you've suggested that, uh, conversations we've had, maybe that you know, some of the previous approaches to criticizing parapsychology are, are uh, there, there could be a better way to do it. So the reason I asked the movement question is that here's a young, you know, every, we have so many new generations of people who hold you up and Randy and Gardner and others kind of as skeptic heroes, as role models, and they want to emulate your approach. They want to do what you've done and kind of continue to carry on the torch. If you're saying it might not have been the best way to go about it, well, what's, what, how, what, what do you have to say to them who say, I want to, I want to, in a fair-minded way, look at parapsychology research, say, and, uh, and see if it's up to scientific standards. Well, in 1986, I wrote this um, article called Proper Criticism, and it's been the most uh, repeatedly published article I've ever written. Mm -hmm. It's been every skeptics group in the world has re republished it, it's been republished again, it's now it's going to be republished in a commemorative issue of the skeptical movement by the British journal The Skeptic. And... Uh, so it's also been published in books and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And all it is, my article on proper criticism, is just a, mat, just a list of platitudes that you should know. If you're attacking someone, don't attack the person, attack the problem. Right. And, uh, and be reasonable and be fair, be sensible. That's about it. It's a bunch of little platitudes like that. Yet it's been the most published thing. Everyone reads it, everyone praises it, and no one follows it. Mm. <laughs> Including myself. Mm. <laughs> But what I'm trying to zone in on is if the approaches that the skeptics movement or leading skeptics have taken in the past, if it might not be the ideal way, what's the alternative? In other words, what's next for the skeptics movement? If, if you're suggesting the answer is not for 
expert critics to invest 50 years in and, and, and whole academic careers into, in a fair-minded way, looking at the parapsychological research, well, what's the alternative? Well, first of all, I don't know, but uh, I do have ideas. Uh, one thing uh, I'm going to correct now, a chance to do it, Curtis is introducing me. By the way, there's some wrong stuff also. People get information on me off the web when they write, wrote about me in this pamphlet that you have to, to program and so on. Some of it's true. <laughs> uh, some of it is not quite true. He said I'm on the uh, executive council. I was on, I was right from the beginning, I was on the executive council. But I think for the last five years I've not been on the executive mm. council. And uh, I've had nothing to do with PSYCOP. Not deliberately. I think it's because we have some... Some strategic differences, maybe. Well, I'm not even sure it's that. Uh, they have differences with me. I don't have differences <laughs> with them. Uh, but okay. Uh, but to me, uh, the skeptics movement, one of the big things we had uh, was allocation of resources. I've always been saying you got to live within your resources, not because I'm a Republican, I'm not, I'm a Democrat, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I do think we ought to use our limited resources. At that time when we started Psych Up, we did have limited resources. We ought to use them wisely and most effectively. And I thought we got the most bang for the buck by focusing on not trying to get to everyone in the world, but focusing on opinion makers, mm -hmm. journalists and teachers, educators. If we could influence those people and help them, we're going to have the biggest audience. The other thing I thought was we were doing the most was with the skeptical inquirer. We were mm -hmm. reaching the most. Mm -hmm. However, uh, Kurtz and the other powers there, somehow we're more, and you used the term, but I thought it was great, edifice. Uh, complex. Yeah, Quote, <laughs> quoting me in front of an audience, great thing to say, but yes, I've uh, cheekily introduced Paul Kurtz a number of times as our man with an edifice complex, wants well, to well, build uh, yeah. an organization. So, yeah, so, buildings. so, so they yeah. keep multiplying these centers all over mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. They're very expensive. Mm -hmm. they, they have to raise money and so on, so they're always raising, fundraising and so on, and, and that's become more what the skeptic, and they, two things, the skeptics movement since it's developed, PSYCOP, has focused more on things like building centers, spreading out, and also fighting among themselves within skeptics. Mm -hmm. And they've mm -hmm. done nothing about trying to re do the outreach, mm -hmm. which is what we're, where we have our, we can do the most. Okay, which and is that, that's one thing I have disagreed with uh, people right from the beginning. It's just as to, uh, one likes to build buildings and, and, uh, and raise money, and mm -hmm. the other likes to do something that's effective, and, and so that's a, just a di difference of opinion. I, I think your criticism about building buildings, that's well taken, people get that, but you're drawing another distinction. You're saying rather than skeptics being geared up to engage the parapsychologist and look at the research and really dig in, rather than that, the agenda should be an outreach or public education mission, opinion leaders, journalists, teachers. Um, that's what you've done, surely, your public appearances, your appearances in the media, but you've also spent the, 50, the last 50 years doing the hard research, looking, or at least looking at the research to see if it's up to snuff. And I'm just trying to pin you down on this. Are you suggesting that that should be less of a priority for the skeptics movement than this public education, this public outreach? I don't know how to answer that because I would say my focus is not... Uh, paranormal or anything like that, ultimately. What I'm co most concerned about is getting, giving people the tools to think mm. and to be, be good, better thinkers. So it's and affirmative. And then somehow yeah. our education system, the, we're, we've not done a good job of that. I think we can do better. And to me, skepticism, you know, in the skeptical movement, uh, dealing with the parapsychology is just a good uh, a forum to, to work on those, those kinds of problems. If we can do it there, then we could do it elsewhere as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. and it's going to involve science. It's going to involve knowledge of thinking, you know, critical thinking. Uh, it's going to involve the things we, 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 we like to pride ourselves on and understanding the psychology of it all as mm -hmm. well. We've got to realize that uh, humans, what human limitations are and what it is that is pushing people in this direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my feeling is that we've got to do more in that, in that direction and, and Skepticism is just one tool for that. Mm. Please join me in thanking uh, Ray Hyman for this fun conversation. Thank you, Ray.
I, I'd like to spend a, f a few minutes now and, and the audience questions. And since this is being recorded, I may paraphrase your question. You'll have to tell me if I got it wrong uh, so that it can be recorded. Question right back there. Uh, Professor Hyman, two questions. I wonder if you would comment or be willing to comment on the, uh, uh, the apparent split between Marcello Truzzi and Psycop and... Uh, the other subject of interest would be Dr. Schwartz's experiments, uh, afterlife experiments, and his new project mm. out there in Arizona. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to comment on. <laughs> uh, Trutzi is a complicated fellow. You, you know, he, uh, he came from a circus background. His father was um, one of the top, considered by, universally by those who know, as probably the second greatest uh, juggler, circus juggler in the world, in history. And uh, so he was born actually in Russia, I think, when because his father was with the European circus. Eventually, his father ended up with the uh, Bar uh, the Ringling brothers, Barnum and Bailey, and that's where why Trutzi grew up and went to school in Florida because of uh, the, that was the where the Ringling brothers have their camp, so and their and their school. And so that's his. He got that interesting background, and then he became a sociologist that. Uh, Eastern Michigan University, is a, is a person of tremendous breadth, knowledge, and into everything, but also he was a person who was dedicated to being in the middle wherever he can. Uh, and his idea was, and we, we split on a lot of things, his idea was to be fair, you've got to give all sides equal time. And I likened his approach to, and he never liked this for some reason, but I likened his approach to saying, look, let's say we have plate of food here we know is certified not having any uh, bacteria or any dangerous organisms uh, and stuff like that. And here we have a, a, a plate of food here that we know is just reeking with all kinds of uh, terrible, dangerous uh, substances in it. His approach to what's the best, best, best thing to eat is to mix the two 50-50. <laughs> and his approach also was you've got to give equal time to all sides, even though one side may, may be crazy and the other side has an awful lot of scientific evidence and everything behind it. And uh, so I never could understand that, and we always split on that kind mm. of a thing. The guy had, had, and I shouldn't speak with him cause, you know, about this because he's dead, but uh, he, uh, he was an interesting guy. I, I, he was a fascinating guy in many ways. But he also reveled in being friends with everyone. Mm. And he, uh, one time I remember uh, we were both at a... Uh, American uh, uh, AAAS uh, meetings in uh, San Francisco. And while there, he said, Ray, why don't you come with me? I'm going to take you to dinner over to um, this guy's house, who happened to be the fellow who, who ran the churches of, um, uh, of, the, of the devil, uh, Satan's churches. Tem Temple of Set, maybe, or the yeah. Anton LaVey? Yeah, Anton yeah. LaVey. Okay, so we went to Anton LaVey's house for dinner. <laughs> and. <great>. Uh, <laughs> And a Anton LaVey had, uh, unfortunately, he had a, a black panther roaming his house as well. <laughs> and uh, I always, when I went to go to the bathroom, so I was really wondering, where was this panther? <laughs> so you're, what you're uh, saying is, but, what led to the split was just this disagreement but, well, uh, let, over Well, let me give you an example. The uh, reason I brought on Anton LaVey is typical. Uh, Trudy considered him a good friend because they both had loved circus music and had some sort of similar backgrounds. But LaVey was very proud of the fact that uh, it was that he had all these people in the Church of Satan, he, all these suckers, he called them, went in front of us. And he, he, among other things, he sold sexual <laughs> objects, you know, he sold these uh, inflatable dolls to them, and he, he made a big living. He was bragging about all that. And I found it kind of off-putting. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and, and and Trudy was always presented himself, and he, that's why he broke with Randy over moral issues. Mm -hmm. When Randy did the Project Alpha, Trudy attacked him very viciously, saying that this was unethical to do. You know, to go into a scientist's laboratory and waste his money by uh, hmm. pretending that you've got psychic powers. Yeah, like for, for our listeners, Project Alpha is when Randy conspired <laughs> to have two young magicians pose as psychic claimants at Washington University and then kind of expose the fraud exactly. in a real gotcha moment. Yeah. And right. the reason Randy did this was because uh, Randy had always been told that when he said, you ought to have a magician there when you design your experiments, you're going to test uh, Uri Geller or some other psychic. Uh, the, the 
scientists always say, or the parapsychologists who are scientists say, we don't need a magician. You know, we're scientists. We know how to control things. They can't pull, pull anything like that on us. So in order to show that they can pull something like that, Randy did that project, Alpha, mm. and it worked. Uh, but Tristan's total reaction was, this was unethical, mm. an unethical thing to do, and you're an unethical person. And so that's why I did big fight. Right. Well, Tristan felt he was the only honest skeptic, honest broker in this whole skeptical business. I, Randy, and other people were biased skeptics, and uh, the other, there was a believers on the other side, and the only person who was the fair person was Marcello Trutz, and he openly said these things, mm-hmm. you know. And we were at a meeting once um, at, the, at the Naval uh, Research Laboratory here in Bethesda. They held a meeting because uh, Senator Claiborne Pell was very upset with the report I had made uh, for the government on uh, parapsychology. He said it was unfair and they shouldn't have had Hyman do it, they should have had someone else do it because Hyman's a known disbeliever or something like mm. that. So Pell got the Office of uh, Congressional Research, which I don't, I don't know if it still exists, but he got them to carry on a special meeting and they had uh, several parapsychologists, but they had Jim Alcock and myself there and Marcello was there. And at this meeting, Marcello stood up and said, well, look, you have Hyman and uh, Alcock over there, but they're, they're not the fair people. I'm the only mm. n- neutral guy here in this room here. And he has represents obviously, this, this was startled me because every parapsychologist always assumes and, and openly thinks that Marcello's on your side. Mm. All the skeptics thought Marcello was an enemy. So, but Marcello thought he was the only neutral person. He thought he was the one person in the middle. I, I want to try to get some other questions. Any uh, right here? Uh, I'm curious uh, your thoughts on uh, James Randi's approach with the million dollar challenge. Uh, do you see that as a good way to investigate or what are your thoughts? I have never been a fan of waving a $10,000 check and then ultimately a million dollar check. I, I don't think that's a good approach to me, but I understand the approach that uh, why Randy and, and the public, probably to the public it appeals more. It's a put up or shut up type mm-hmm, of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it makes no sense to me as a scientist. Uh, it doesn't prove anything one way or the other. But uh, I just have to say it's not my approach, but I can't mock it. Question right there. I'm so fascinated by the fact that you've worked with federal entities on these issues. Could you give us some reflection about where the hopeful ways might be to help penetrate the pseudoscientific approaches of the federal government? I give the example of the fact that FDA still allows homeopathy. Um, we've got some strange new light device that's now been FDA approved. We've got that's the agency I come from. We're using the polygraph right and left. And a lot of these other things are very dubious science. How can we help the federal government to think more rationally about this? I'm not sure uh, how to do that because the, the government agencies is this big bureaucracy with all kinds of little pockets in it. And what I found was that there are pockets that do all kinds of weird stuff, but the other pockets don't know about it. And there are also uh, real good skeptics in, 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 in the area as well. The military, the CIA, I know, and um, uh, some of the other agencies that I have had some direct contact with. Uh, and, and it's, it, what, what you have is that one side doesn't know what the other side's doing. Uh, one of the things I found was that if you had, if I could get access and they, if they had a centralized database where I could check how many things, parapsychological things are going on, there's no way I could find out. I and mean, I don't think the President of the United States anyone could find out because what I find was that, uh, Many of the people doing weird stuff, parapsychological work or something like that, like in the Navy, I found that uh, you only find these by, by accident. A lot of things that are called parapsychological, that are parapsychological work, go under different names. They use code names for them. Mm. They put, they put uh, perception under unusual conditions. Well, that, that fits a lot of things, you know, underwater and submarines, mm. up and out of space and stuff like that. But a lot of the people doing oddball ESP experiments and other stuff will use that to cover up what they're doing. So there, and this John Alexander uh, at, um, when I was on the uh, uh, Committee on Techniques for Enhancing Human Performance, which was basically the Army Research Institute put up this money to have the National Academy of Sciences uh, look into borderline techniques such as um, uh, neuro-linguistic programming, uh, meditation, 
sleep women <coughs> and parapsychology. Uh, many vendors are selling techniques to various branches of the military based on these things. So we were asked to look at, to see if there's any one of these things that have any possibility of being good, you know, that the government was currently then using, including, you know, using these uh, recordings, uh, sub, subliminal persuasion, and so on. And um, most of the people, even in the agencies where this was going on, didn't know that it was going on, you know. Mm. Uh, this John Alexander, Colonel Alexander, was running a military ordnance research at uh, Fort Meade, I think it was. And uh, he was sponsoring the research uh, of uh, Cleve Baxter. Baxter was the guy in the 1960s, was the first guy to attach uh, electrodes to a phalodendron plant and show that it responded to, psychically, to people, uh, to brine shrimp being burned in another room or something like that. And that started the talking to plants movement, stuff like that. Well, Baxter's still around, he's still doing research like that. And uh, John Alexander, Colonel Alexander, when he was running the uh, ordnance laboratory, was funding his work. How did he get away with that? Mm. This is guns he's supposed to be dealing with, right? Uh, he did, got away with it because he said, he told us ourselves, our committee, he said, look, uh, uh, if I spend anything over $10,000, I've got to document everything you know, to support some research. But if I spend anything up to $10,000, I don't have to say anything about it. <laughs> So he was giving this guy ten thousand dollars a day, you know, as a separate, each one's a separate country. So he didn't have to report it. Mm. So no real clear roadmap on how to diminish the government's support itself for uh, pseudoscience. Well, well, what it amounts to is the government is, is just a microcosm of the rest of the society. Mm. It's the same thing. Some parts don't know what the other parts doing, and and people there are rogues are all around, and it may be good or bad because there are. Whole areas in the, in the CIA and Defense Department, something like that, where people go off and do their own thing, and the other rest of the people don't know about it. Even the head of the CIA doesn't know about it, you know. Mm. Uh, it's just amazing. It's just such a big bureaucracy, but also all these little pockets of people doing some strange things. And I'd like to believe that they still are a minority, but I'm not so sure. But mm. uh, because, I, you know, the head of, when I was there, our committee was formed in 1985, then retired head of INSCOM, Army Intelligence. Uh, Albert Stubblebein III, who uh, I, uh, uh, Tammy over here uh, confirms for me, she, she knew Stubblebein. They were good friends, obviously, right? <laughs> no, but she knew Stubblebein. Uh, he's the brother of Lee Marvin. He looks like him, too. Uh, so Lee Marvin's name must have been Stubblebein, too, I guess, before he changed it to Marvin. Okay, so we, I think we have time for uh, one more question. Uh, anyone? Right over here. Um, you've spent a lot of time in academia, and I understand that um, uh, getting grant money is very, very difficult. Um, how is it that um, even with um, really nothing to show for it over many, many years, that there are still departments of parapsychology, there's still money being uh, awarded to, to research in parapsychology? Parapsychology gets practically no funding, government funding. And what little it got, by the way, a big deal is made out of the fact that the 20 year research in Stargate you know, on remote viewing got $7 million. That's a, that's a pittance mm. of, the, of the military budget. But actually, uh, the only reason that that number, $7 million, comes around is because they got it from me. I was trying to find out how much was being spent only in one laboratory in California on the research they were doing, uh, being supported by the, the, first the CIA, but then it was a national um, uh, defense intelligence agency. I'm sorry. <laughs> Defense Intelligence Agency was, what happened was the CIA had, for the first five years or so of the remote viewing, they had been supporting it, but then decided it was going nowhere, so they dropped it. But the, then the Defense Intelligence Agency took it over, and they were supporting it. For, so for 20 years, this program was going on, and uh, no one knew how much money was being spent on it. But I just tried to find out uh, on one laboratory how much they'd gotten, and he told me over five years they got $7 million of funding. Mm. That one lab. That one lab. So I happen to mention that, and that became the word all over. Now it becomes, once you say something like that, that becomes it. And so I'm, I unfortunately was the inadvertent well, there. So uh, Barry King Live, when he had me on, he said, you know, how can the government waste $7 million of our money? I, you know, $7 million is a pittance, right? For the, the terms of it. But he, so the people who were incensed about this kept emphasizing that the $7 million wasted. And the, yeah, the people on the other side uh, who didn't want to interview me, they interviewed uh, instead Jessica Utz, or, uh, my other, she was the other part of the team, that, and she's the parapsychologist part of the team. 
If they wanted a program where they want to emphasize, look, the government's doing this wonderful stuff, it's like a remote viewing, how open, we got a great government, mm. uh, they would interview her. If they want to uh, emphasize the negative, they would interview me. But during that interview, they always brought up to seven million dollars. How our government was wasting seven million dollars of your precious tax dollars. <laughs> Uh, Ray, Ray, last question, and it's it's really kind of a follow up on that, and then we'll finish up. After fifty years of looking into this stuff, do you think the questions are still worth asking? Is the research still worth doing? So, even if it's not government funded, is it still worth looking into all this stuff? For my part, no. Uh, but uh, you know, if people want to do it, I say okay. If they're going to do it, I hope they do it in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you very much for the conversation, Ray Hyman. Thank you for listening to this episode of For Good Reason. For updates throughout the week, find me on Twitter and on Facebook. To get involved with an online conversation about this interview with Ray Hyman, join the discussion at forgoodreason.org. Views expressed on For Good Reason aren't necessarily the views of the James Randi Educational Foundation. Questions and comments on today's show can be sent to info at forgoodreason.org. For Good Reason is produced by Thomas Donnelly and recorded from St. Louis, Missouri. For Good Reason's music is composed for us by Emmy Award-nominated Gary Stockdale. Christina Stevens contributed to today's show. I'm your host, DJ Grothy. 